This episode is brought to you by the Regional Air Quality Council. This summer, go wild for front range air quality and leave the car at home and walk, bike, or scoot shorter distances to reduce ground level ozone. Remember, to reduce that ground level ozone, you have to turn your car off and definitely don't idle with the AC on. Created from pollutants like car exhaust, ozone is the front range's biggest air quality issue and the leading cause of respiratory problems. Know when it matters most to take these simple steps for better air. Sign up for summer ozone text alerts by sending better air CO to 21000 or visit simplestepsbetterair.org. That's simplestepsbetterair.org. Today on CityCast Denver, Alan Berg was a beloved local radio host here in the 70s and 80s, famous for confronting white supremacists, anti-Semites, and other extremists on the air until he was assassinated in 1984 by a group of white supremacists known as the Order of Death. To mark the 40th anniversary of Berg's death, KNUS host Peter Boyles recently wrote a remembrance for the Denver Post. He's on today to share more about his former colleague and friend. Today is Thursday, June 27th. I'm Bree Davies, and here's what Denver's talking about. Peter Boyles, welcome to CityCast Denver. This is cool. Thank you very much. Peter, who was Alan Berg? Oh, wow. Um, he was an attorney in uh, Chicago, and... I'm in recovery as well, but as al- he was alcoholic and um, he got disbarred. He had gone to school out here, so he came out here, gained his recovery, opened up uh, two two stores. He had one called the Boot Broker, one called the Shirt Broker on Larimer Street. Well, there was a talk show host, a guy named Lawrence Gross, would get custom shirts, and he comes in and he meets this guy, and he realizes this is a diamond in the rough. So it starts bringing him on as a guest. And then Lawrence is offered a gig. So Alan's a shirt, oh. selling shirts at his store. And shirts he, and shoes. I mean, this goes back to my theory. A lot of the us from customer service go on to do things like what things, you and I are doing right now. Greater things than this. So yeah. Gross goes to the owners and says, look, here's your boy. You know, when I leave, give the show to Alan. And they did. And so there's only a couple of people that I've ever been around that sat down and got it. And uh, Berg literally walked in, plopped down in the chair, and he had it. People weren't, well, they were not ready for Berg. And Why weren't they ready for Berg? Because I'm here and he's a shirt salesman who can, who but he was talks a, remember, a good game, remember, right? He was a defense attorney. Oh, good point. Yeah. Previous to. Oh, so he knew how to argue. Right? Argue. <laughs> <laughs> he knew how to get his point across. Uh, so to speak. Uh, and I, by the way, I adored him and he taught me a lot. An example. So Berg's working at BZ, Elvis dies. This is how long ago this is. And we're doing mornings and grown men are calling crying. I mean, they were so- Yeah, that's one of those, the world stops deaths. Berg's on the air. He's saying, the guy couldn't sing a note. <laughs> oh, I'm not making this up. You know, and he was running down all these other great singers who could were better than, better than Elvis. And the book had come out about his- his old um, entourage wrote a book about not not that Alan had read it, but he had read these these excerpts about Elvis and drugs, and now it starts to come out. So he lays the wood to Elvis, and that was Alan. I mean, he. I've said to people um, at his eulogy, I said he was the greatest professional wrestler that ever did radio, and we were very, very close, and we would have dinner on Friday nights together, and. And always would talk. And I talked about the business a lot. There were times I didn't know where where the real actually ended or began. And the Berg the show, act. The showman. Yeah. was I, There were times when it would cross over and I'd say. And that's what led into a lot of the stuff that. That he was, he and I say assassinated, not murdered. He was a, he was assassinated. The thing that really destroyed him was any form of racism or any form of anti-Semitism that that gutted him. And so I knew when those things happened, that was the real guy. Uh, the stuff like Elvis couldn't sing. I, that was like that was Berg. 
Allenberg quickly developed a reputation in Denver as a firebrand, a shock jock before Howard Stern or Don Imus or any of the bomb-throwing talk radio hosts that came to define the medium. And because KOA had a 50,000-watt signal, his voice was broadcast far beyond Denver to the whole Western United States, and his following only grew. Let's go back, though, to June 18th, 1984, that night. Sure. What happened to Alan? What initially happened is uh, we were working at KOA together, and uh, I did 9 to noon, and then we did this hour, and then he would come in at 1 o'clock and did the lead up to the news. KOA, the the call letters, you know, king of agriculture. And so traditionally, they got all these little farm and ranch newspapers. So this is the original premise of KOA, which we know as news radio today was king of agriculture. Well, remember they were designations like WLS in Chicago was put on air by Sears, the world's largest store. Yeah. And and they've calls meant stuff. And so we got all these newspapers and they would just dump them in this office that Alan and I and our producers, a guy named Larry Crandall, good guy. So I'd sit in there and read them. And I come across the Primrose and Cattleman's Gazette published by a guy named Roderick, you call him Rick Elliott. And I'm just, I'm just in a leafing, and he has published the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Now, the Protocols were a creation by Nicholas I, not the second, but Nicholas Romanoff. And he had a secret police called the Okrana. And they manufactured these protocols about how Jews were going to take over the world or were taking over the world. And and it's in the newspaper. This is in like a farm and ranch publication. And, uh, yeah, I'm in this guy. And I was stunned. And so I went, I went to Larry because I could have a guest in between our 12 and 1. I said, can you see if you can get this guy on the show? Larry calls a guy and the guy says, sure. And so it's a phone interview. It's not a face-to-face. So it gets, as I said in the post, it got rough quick. And uh, so Alan would come in quarter of one, and he gives me the shoulder tap, and I put Elliot on hold, and I look at him, he said, he points, he goes, I want him. So I come back after the break, and I said to Rick Elliot, I said, my colleague, Alan Berg, would like to continue this conversation. Rick Elliot said yes. That was the beginning. Peter told me that after Alan confronted this guy, Rick Elliott, on the air, he went back and looked at past editions of the Primrose and Cattlemen's Gazette. He saw more anti-Semitic garbage, but also a lot of government-funded advertising to recruit young men to the army. So Patricia Schroeder, she was congresswoman, and she was the head of Congressional Armed Services. She was on, 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 she was the head of the committee. So she and I were pretty tight. I called her up and I said, do you know that this money's being spent? On, and I'm, I'm, I'm on a phone with her. She yanked the ads. So you hit this guy's bottom line. So he came back with a lawsuit. He sued Allen. He sued KOA. And he sued me personally. So su- sued us all. And the judge just threw it out. Shortly after this confrontation, KOA's bosses moved Allen Berg to Knights, where he got even more famous for confronting far-right extremists, racists, and anti-Semites on the air. And even though he had made some enemies, he wouldn't hold back. So he's at night and he had just really irritated these people. So uh, Rick Elliott came back on with him at night. And then another guy named Jack Moore, who was a supremacist. Well, you know, Berg, Berg's him. And a place up in Idaho called Hayden Lake and Richard Butler, if, you, if that's familiar to you. Well, they were, they were Aryan nations. Another white supremacist group. They were supremacist. Well, Bob Matthews or Robert J. Matthews was the founder of something called The Order. And he's up there with some of the colleagues, members, of, and they're in the back, and they're listening to KOA radio. All the way. Yeah. And that, I believe, that night was the night that after Berg does what he does to all of their heroes, to Jack Moore and Rick Elliott. I think that's the night. Now, that was the 18th of January, 84. and Six months before Allen's And murder. they think they decide, that, and they, they make him into something that, that I said that it was to kill a mockingbird. I mean, they, they 
killing Alan. But they then decide that night that he's got to go. Six months after Berg confronted those white supremacist leaders on KOA, four members of the order showed up at his home on Adams Street right off Colfax, armed with semi-automatic weapons. And they murder him. My, my saving grace is I've talked to a lot of physicians and they said he never felt it. That what they did to him, he never... He wasn't suffering. He wasn't going to suffer. And so he's dead in the driveway and they, they take off. To this day, as we say, and I wrote it in the post and it kind of floored people that, and I had to go read some, some documents, but no one ever stood trial. No one was ever convicted for the murder of Allen Berg. It's amazing. It's crazy. It's, well, then there's not a, there's not a marker. There's not. I mean, if we're, there's no plaque, there's no, you point this out in your story, there's yeah. no street sign, there's no, Nothing. and honestly, Peter, I grew up here. Yeah. I've been reading the news as long as I can remember. Yeah. It wasn't until I was in my 30s and an art, like a sort of activist artist friend sure. told me who Ellen Berg was. I didn't learn about him in journalism school. I didn't, you know. I got, we struggled and got him, Kevin Flynn and a lot of good people. So now he's in the Press Club Hall of Fame. And when you go to the Press Club, there's a, a display. Uh, I think he belongs in the National Press Club in D.C., but that's me. But we have Omar Ja, which is righteous. We have Bruce Randolph. We have Pena. We have, you know, Dick Connor Boulevard. With, and here's this guy. Yeah. And if there is a hate crime, that was a hate crime. And so it's just unmarked. This episode is brought to you by the Coldwell Banker Denver Century Ride. Cycle the city this year with the Coldwell Banker Denver Century Ride in partnership with CityCast Denver. For 13 years, this event has been Denver's ultimate urban cycling tour. You can discover the Metro's most bikeable streets, trails, lanes, and parks. The Century Ride is on Saturday, September 28th and starts and finishes at the shops at Northfield. Participants can choose to ride 25, 50, 85, or 100 mile courses. The courses will be supported with aid stations, police details, and bike mechanics the whole way. This ride benefits Bicycle Colorado, the state's leading cycling advocacy organization. For more information, check out denvercenturyride.com. Now through July 15th, get 10% off your registration. Again, that's denvercenturyride.com. This episode is brought to you by Denver Health. Heading to Winter Park this summer? Don't forget, Denver Health's Winter Park Medical Center is right there for you at the base of the resort. Whether it's a routine checkup, a pulled muscle from hiking, or even altitude sickness, Denver Health is here for you. Denver Health offers primary care, urgent care, sports medicine, emergency services, and so much more. The Winter Park Medical Center serves the community with men's and women's wellness visits, pediatric care, prenatal care, sick visits, and radiology services. The location is optimal for connecting with visitors and locals all around the Grand County area. From wellness exams and immunizations to managing chronic illness, Denver Health has you covered. Denver Health's Winter Park Medical Center is open all year long to ensure you're always taken care of. For more information, visit denverhealth.org slash winterpark. That's denverhealth.org slash winterpark. I want to give listeners the sense of anti-Semitism at this time in Denver in the 80s. Like, what was Berg really confronting? That question's been asked a lot. We didn't know. I mean, I mean, it would be wonderful to be able to sit in a while then. But, you know, um, I've used this too many times, but one of the, the, and I forget, I'm always wrong about which Greek philosopher, so I won't, but who said, uh, little boys kill frogs in sport, but frogs die in earnest. And these guys had no idea who he was. And they had manufactured him into this. I mean, these are guys who are reading the Turner Diaries and they're reading the protocols and they're- They're being indoctrinated elsewhere. And, and they, have, they have Richard Butler teaching them that Jesus wasn't Jewish. And I mean, it goes on and on and on. And they, they, they were drinking their own Kool-Aid. On the other hand, Berg and I are, we're going, we're looking at the ratings going, God, you know, these are great. And we're counting our money and- we're going to dinner and- So there's like two very different stories oh, happening here is what I'm hearing from absolutely. you. It's like there's these guys being radicalized and then you guys are talk radio guys we're, who are talking about yeah. things of the day from your perspective, yeah, yeah. I mean, knowing yeah. full well you're firing folks up and things. But from what I'm, the sense I'm getting from you, it's like 
there were, I don't know if the reaction matched the reality. After he was murdered, then I began to see and read, and we'd, we'd run up against David Duke, and there was a, a, a paramedic out in Lakewood, and you know, nickel dime stuff. And but they were, as I said, they were great rating getter. You know, you get those guys. But I kind of looked at that as the price of admission. You know, you want to play this game? This is what we're going to do. We had no clue. And the important thing was that none of the none of the men that killed him ever called him. They never did a word. Best of my knowledge, no. And they just simply did what they did. I thought a lot about this when in your description of the night and what happened yeah. and uh, Alan himself, the sort of like meek, he had kind of a crazy haircut because he oh. was covering up scars from yeah. surgery. I yeah. mean, like he wasn't this like all powerful, big person, but he had a platform, but also like he's just a, he's a guy, you set the scene, he's getting out of his Volkswagen bug. Like that's, I grew up that way too. It's like, he's yeah. like a working class dude. And then- these guys come and assassinate him. He, he, I'll tell you who he was. He was a Muppet. <laughs> he kind of looked like oh, one, to be he, honest. He was Peter. He, I mean, he was, I mean, I, I, I loved him, but I knew who he was. And he was as fragile as any performer is. I just wonder, this experience you're describing, you're in the studios with these guys that end up being connected to this murder of your friend. I wonder, after it happened, how did you feel going on the air after that? Did, were you scared? Uh, no. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not trying to act brave, but it, I, I mean, I, I was, that led me into actually gaining my sobriety. I was so disconnected and um, my children were little and only now they both talked to me about how impactful that was on them because, first of all, they knew him. He did what I did for a living, and no one knew, you know, who killed him. And there was a moment where some reporter goes into the Denver PD and says, who, do you, who did it? And the guy picked up a Denver phone book and threw it on the desk in front of the reporter and said, pick a name. That's how they had no idea. You didn't feel vulnerable at all yourself? Doing the same thing that I mean, you know, I know you weren't Alan Berg, but no. you guys are cut from well, the same cloth. It sounds like very yeah. similar. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of wannabes that would start carrying guns and uh, and wearing bulletproof and everything. And um, I'm going to actually have a lunch in uh, first part of July with Rabbi Foster at uh, and to he, he was he he was a guy that I credit when apparently Temple Emanuel didn't want to hold the um, memorial for any number of reasons. And I spoke at it, and uh, uh, his brother-in-law came from Chicago and spoke, and Rabbi spoke. And so I'm, I'm, I'm out in the parking lot. There's guys that I will never mention their names that are carrying guns, and I'm thinking, I'm more afraid of you carrying a gun than what conceivably can happen, because no one knew. I mean, literally, when I tell you, and it's easy to sit here with you 40 years later, oh, this, that, and the other thing, I had no idea. What do you miss the most about your friend? Oh, we talked about how much fun he'd be having on the air right now with Donald Trump. I mean, he would have. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I'm thinking about. Yeah. It's like, what would he be oh. like in this moment or, oh. you know, the last 10 years of he, politics? He would have. I can almost close my eyes and see him. He was a chain smoker, palmos, and his hands would fly when he would do radio. He didn't sit there and do it like we're doing it. He would gesture and he would do this and he'd do that and he would hang up on people and you know and call people names and he he would be having if he was still with us and he would be having the time of his life because he this was the stuff that he i mean he, he the thing about living for something he lived for this do you think he'd have an audience today the same way with his they, style? they, they would they would hate him more they would, he would be hated more, but I worked, I was lucky enough, I worked in professional wrestling off and on for four or five years. And I, it was the bad guys. They call them the heels. The heels sold tickets. Not the, they call the good guys baby faces or faces. Faces don't sell tickets. Heels sell tickets. And he, Berg was a heel. He, he played a heel on the air. People would listen to him because they didn't like him. Sure. Hey, hate, hate listeners, hate readers, people that, yeah, I think that's very common oh, in media. We used to talk about it, you know, and he said, I'll tell you who it is. 
And he, he said he had this demo of the little old lady in Capitol Hill painting her dog's toenails, smoking palm oils, because he smoked palm oils, smoking palm oils and listening to him and getting mad at him. And so it was Trickberg taught me. And we got mail. We got, there's way before the internet. So we would get mail. I mean, tons of mail. And he'd say, I'll show you something. And he would open the letter and he'd turn it over. And if it wasn't signed, he'd throw it out. Oh, he didn't want anonymous criticism. And now, with, when I work now, we get all the e- emails and text messaging. You know where it comes from. But yeah. he would turn the letter over. And if it wasn't signed, don't read that. And he would open my mail. <laughs> you know why he's going to read that. You don't read that. But and it, was, it was brilliant. He was blocking trolls before we were blocking trolls. He he was like he 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 knew stuff without knowing that he knew it, and uh, you know they they took him so seriously, and he really was the mockingbird. He was Harper Lee's mockingbird. Why do you think Denver should remember him? Well, first of all, how his life ended mm-hmm. is, and and the, like I said, I mentioned to you earlier, we have all these memorials and. Street names changes, and they're all right. That was the right thing to do, but not him. And I don't. I mean, I've tried several different mayors, and I mean, finally, the press club, to to their credit, has now um, a, a memorial for him. How long it took thirty? At, we did it last year. 30, 38 years for them to recognize this this guy. And the, the I, I went to the broadcaster hall of fame lunch because they were inducting Charlie Martin and I worked with. And and they're all there at this table. And I said, I said, A.B., I used to call him A.B. I said, A.B.'s not in. What's wrong with you people? And I just had a conversation after the piece appeared in the Post with a guy that's on their committee. I said, you know what? I said, it's a damn shame that you guys haven't done this. And he said, would you talk him in? I said, of course I'd talk him in. So we'll see um, what they do. But... Uh, but before it gets away, um, I'm an old man now, and memories are dimming. And if you don't do it now, it'll get away. He, he, he changed the face of the business. It's, it's not near what it was when, when he would come in and sit down and light him up, because he could do it. Never saw anything quite like it in my life. I mean. He had this visceral way, and maybe it's from being a defense attorney, that you could gut the jury or whatever it was. But he could come in, and phone lines, would be, they're waiting for him. <laughs> <laughs> and and he's, he's waiting for them. Peter Boyles, thank you so much. Well, thank you for letting me do that. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed the show, why not take a minute to tell the Broadcasters Hall of Fame about us? Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter and learn more about us at denver.citycast.fm. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See ya. <laughs> you sound, you're sounding good. Well, you're kind, but... I just got we know you. we're dealing with a professional. A trained professional. <laughs>